Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Wednesday Night Live with Simon Jacobson. Kindred spirits, the power of synergy. Ladies and gentlemen in the crowd, I welcome you all to talk about synergy. What's so funny? We could have canned laughter for a com- you know the comedy shows. There's no one there. They just have a recorded laughter. Three, four different types. Jeff, go ahead. I just need every joke I make laugh. That's all. Okay. Go like this. So when you look at the history of the group of group mentality of groups, communities. You come away often with a very negative conclusion. The concept ideas like herd mentality, groupthink, cults, brainwashing, uh, bandwagon uh, syndrome. The basis of a lot of marketing, maybe the basis of all marketing and advertising in our time, is that people follow people. You want to make something popular, conventional, Nobody wants to miss the boat. If they feel everybody's doing it, they're part of it. So, per se, on on the surface level, you could think of it as very innocuous and innocent. But in the worst extreme of it, it can become literally horrific. You look at the last century, the blind obedience of of the German people to their authorities. In a different way in Stalin's Russia different totalitarian regimes. So we saw, we're witness to what kind of devastation that brought on, where everybody was just going because everybody's doing it. Even today there are studies, tests that were made, that when a group of people have an authority, a policeman, or some type of official everyone thinks has authority, telling you to do something, people will listen without question. The same people would be skeptical and challenged would listen. So that could be pretty chilling of a perspective on communities. I remember as a teen, as a, in high school, one of the required short stories in the literature books was called The Lottery. I don't know if you uh, ever read the, the, the short story. What's The Lottery? The Lottery goes like this. This is a spoiler in case you haven't read it, but it's a short story, so let's... Um, the Lottery begins... Uh, the story goes like this. There's a little town beautiful people in town. And as the story begins, everybody's preparing for a special day, special holiday. The kids are going to stores to get special clothing. Uh, The stores all will be closed that day. Um, Husbands, wives, fathers, mothers, everybody's preparing for the special day. As the build-up goes and the story builds up, it's all about you see, think it's going to be unbelievable? Like, you know, feel like, like a holiday. Finally, the day came, comes, and you have no idea, we have, still have no idea what's happening on this day, but everybody in the city has come together, and, and the towns come together, and they all gather to the center of the town. It's, it's written very dramatically. And then a lottery is thrown, and hence the name of the story is Lottery, the lottery. A lottery all the names of all the people in the town are in that lottery. And whoever is picked enters into the center of, the, of a big circle that the whole town creates. And they stone this person to death. That's the whole story. And of course then the teacher provokes and evokes response from the students. What do we learn from this? So it's basically the, what, what human beings can do. Everything seems so beautiful. Holiday. Just one small little uh, caveat that they kill somebody. But everyone's doing it. It's been done years and years. And that's part of the story, how for years, and, and children are told stories about how their parents and their grandparents and great-grandparents did this. And then it all leads to this. Basically, the dangers of brainless and blind obedience and conformity. So we've, we've heard the horrors. Anyone's read 1984, George Orwell's 1984, called Newspeak. That's the language of the new time. New speak is a language that everybody must conform to, whether it goes against your sensibilities or not. War is peace, love is hate, and so on. 
And this becomes the the, the 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 cold and sinister world that George Orwell, people were saying, he wrote it about communism, but he masked it in a type of futuristic story of total authority going against all the sensibilities of our own freedoms. Now all of this disturbs anyone, especially in our times, because we consider, us, consider ourselves fiercely individualistic, independent. United States, independence. Independence Day, Bill of Rights, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, all the freedoms. So it, we, we are in an age where many, we, many of us um, celebrate free-spiritedness, free-wheeling free-spiritedness. So any of these ideas of conformity are very disturbing to us. And yet, are we less conformist today than we were in the past? Are the dangers gone? As I mentioned before with marketing, what we watch, what we read, what we, how we dress, where we travel, is it really based on independent choices or is it based on what was sold to us? First by our parents and educators, then by the media, social pressure, peer pressure, etc., etc. How many people like Coca-Cola, Coke? Diet Coke. It's two new cultures. The Coke culture and the Diet Coke culture. You know, Coke is the biggest brand in the world. A drink that is basically not necessary in any way for human survival. As a matter of fact, some will say it's even destructive. But in enough measure that it can be regulated, that it can, that it's still legal. But it has occupied the imagination of young children, of adults. Coke, you can't have a, you can't have a burger or a Frank without a Coke. You need Coke, 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 Coke. So if it was bread or water, a necessity, and that was marketed, this is a complete fabrication. You know? And yet, look how many millions and millions and billions of people drink Coke. It's not an attack on Coca-Cola. It's just an a, uh, observation, a social observation of what our world is like. And at the end of the day, how many people are truly pioneers that have the courage, the strength to stand up against the tide? to go against the tide, to get, go against the, the grain. It's not common. It's not common at all. So we admire the concept. Everybody loves the idea of a nonconformist, a pioneer, to not take no for an answer. Nothing is impossible. Breakthrough. We love the idea. But you know, like the paratrooper, the guy who was training to become a paratrooper. So he goes up on the plane, you know, there's a whole process. You stay on the, the, the paratrooper plane. You see the more seasoned veterans pack themselves up and how they jump and they're all the technique. And he's studying it. After a month of training, the commander says, okay, it's your turn, get online." He's all excited. He packs up his parachute, all the other gear he needs, gets online, comes to the big opening of the plane, looks down, runs back, no, 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 I'm not jumping so fast. Okay, we have that issue. We have people like that too. They need another month of training. Another month of training. Another month passes. He comes back, he gets online. And this time he's sure that he's going to jump. He comes, one look, no. So the commander says, listen, you know, this is not made for the weak-hearted. Not everybody's fit to be a paratrooper. You know, enlist in some other part of the military and you'll make your contribution. So he says, no, no, I really want to be here. I love this. I'll help with the provisions, with the resources. I'll help pack them up. I'll bring them, prepare food. I'll do everything to help the paratroopers. He says, but you're never going to jump. Why do you want to be here? He says, I may never jump, but I like to be around people who jump. You know? He likes to be around people who have courage. who will never have the courage. So that's a concept. You know, We love to watch others do great things. So this issue of conformity, as much as, as chilling as it is, and some even attribute the religion and religious authority over the last 2,000 years, especially Christian, and now we see a lot of Muslim aut or autocracies or, and so on, where religion, some say, basically the imposition of power upon the masses and, and the quenching any type of individuality and so on, to the extent that many say religion and conformity are synonymous. So the idea of a group has in many ways create have a deep stereotype of negativity around it. Even though we all participate in it, but you sit down with someone and say, Tell me what do you think about a group? Right away, group of group, am I part of the group? Maybe, maybe not. You know? <clears throat> it's 
So I want to address this topic from a perspective going back, tracing the roots of communion, social communion, as early back as we can. We can start documenting it. So you have in science today the documentation of when, at least how science sees it, when human beings began to create tribes, groups, herds, in order to hunt better, in order to build better, in order to protect themselves, etc., etc. So they recognize the power of the group versus the unit, the individual, that is. So the idea became very much part of human nature. Some people say it's very much part of our inherent nature. We're social creatures. We're social animals. We need others. Loneliness is not natural. It's very, very difficult to be lonely. Obviously, there are times we're alone, but we need company. We need companionship, whether it's in the form of friendship, whether it's in the form of romantic uh, and intimate companionship, or just a network, a social setting, a social support. Human beings, the Maimonides says, Adam is Medini. Medini means a social creature. Medini means like a person that's part of a whole. But at the same time, the question is, where does individuality end and where does the group begin? And what happens when there's a conflict between the two? So go more to the philosophical and the political side of it. This has been the challenge of what government is all about. How do you balance individual rights and communal good? Because if everybody's left to do whatever they want based on self-interest, take the extreme of self-interest, Ayn Rand, where all that matters is your happiness and your own self-interest, it's bound to conflict with someone else's self-interest. And definitely with the communal good. I mean, think of parents and children. What happens the parents and their own selfish needs need one thing, the children need them to be there. Who prevails? Who gets compromised? So this is a big question. It's a big question regarding government. So the truth is, until 300 years ago, the issue really was not on the table in the, in the, in the world at all, because who, who ruled the world? Monarchs or the church, or monarchs of different sorts, both in the East and the West, that ruled. And it was a given that the moral authority was, an, it was a complete, absolute moral authority of the, of the reigning monarch. If he happened to be benevolent, great, he or she, and if not, too bad. The concept of, a, of, a, of an institutionalizing rights is relatively new, last few centuries. The United States is the first country to institutionalized in a constitution called the Bill of Rights that I mentioned before. And also has led many ch challenges. You know, if you take a very liberal libertarian view, libertarian, I should say, um, a real extreme individuality, we would not have a government like ours. The United States went through this, the Civil War. It ultimate, was ultimately an expression of this issue. Are we United States? Many states united? Or do we each have our own rights? And it was a big conflict of how to do that. How do you maintain state boundaries while having one United States? Some argued early on that it will never work. Every state is a country of its own. Every state has its own needs. It came to head with slavery, where the North and the South each had their own needs. Not to say the North was more benevolent, if you know the story. The North was more industrial and had needed less, less of slave labor. So this was a big issue. How do you combine the two? And it still has... A, you see how many issues that the federal government will defer to state authority. And then there's the state, and then there's the cities. So it's not a simple matter of balancing many interests and, create, and and maintaining some type of balance, harmony. Some argue that it's far easier to have one monarch who just runs the show. Yes, there's risks because if he's corrupt and uh, abusive... It's terrible, but it's one guy. Much worse than having a 50 or 50,000 or 50 million monarchs. What well, Ben-Gurion said. The problem in Israel is that you have 3 million prime ministers. That's the issue. And yet we have, we have come to terms and we have evolved to the point we have today government, like the United States, where we have rights. I know there's the cynics who will say the conspiracy here is just as bad as in any of the most communist regimes. But then the day there are rights, what do they say, they said, both, in, both in the former Soviet Union and the United States, there's, both of them have freedom of speech. The difference is what happens afterwards. One is arrested and shot, and the other one 
You know the story with Khrushchev. Khrushchev was the prime minister of, Israel, of, of uh, Russia, the Soviet Union, that took over the premier of Soviet Union after Stalin died, 1953. So someone was arrested because he was yelling of, of the rooftops that uh, Khrushchev is crazy. They arrested him, and that kangaroo court with only a prosecutor and no defense, no due process, he was sentenced to death. But two death penalties, two bullets. One, for insulting a head of state. And two, for revealing a state secret. The Khrushchev was crazy. So you know, you have these uh, these, these jokes, and uh, that unfortunately capture a lot of the truth. Um, I'm not suggesting the United States is a perfect country. But certain rights are pretty much protected here. As a Jew, you have to acknowledge this is the first time in, in, our, in history that we have a country that opened up and became a haven for, uh, for Jews and for other minorities and gave us the ability to practice freely without any fears. So whatever you say about other issues in the country, I'm not suggesting there isn't, you know, people talk about surveillance and they talk about privacy issues and so on and all that. But you cannot deny in real time that we have certain gifts and freedoms here. No matter what conspiracy, what kind of conspiracy theorist you are, that cannot be denied, and that was unprecedented. So clearly, a type. And remember, it was also always defended. The Inquisition of Spain that was har- did horrible things to Jews also justified. It. They justified it. We need to have the good, the good, the good of the community. The community is Catholic, and these minority of Jews are, are like upstarts, and they're rebelling against it. We need to put them in place. It was also justified. It wasn't just criminals saying, "Let's kill the Jews." And Hitler too, Imach Shemar. He also had a whole so-called obscene ideology, but an ideology nevertheless about Lebensraum, pure Aryans, the Jews are aliens, they'll never be part of us, etc., etc. So there's always justification in the name of the, glo- the greater good. The whole basis of socialism and Marxism and communism was the greater good. The problem was the individuals that took over its control at the helm of the greater good were the most corrupt of them all. They say that the irony is that in communism there was more abuse of individual right than all capitalism put together because you gave it all the control to one person. Capitalism, at least you have a whole bunch of crooks. Here it's one crook. And on and on. So this, so this the tenuous relationship between individual and community, I just want to, I, I want to just, I'm just making a big case of how it's across the board, literally. And if you bring it back home, to our personal lives, you see the, battle, the challenge and the battle is there as well. What do we have in our personal lives? Take, them, take relationships. Welcome. There's a few empty seats left. Please, take them. You know. What are the... In, in, in our personal lives, this issue is a big one. Marriage. Love. Many people say, can you balance two individuals two fiercely individual spirits and come together in a marriage, in a harmony, where one does not compromise the other. So many people who are support the institution of marriage will say, you know, you have to give up your individuality for some greater good. If you're, if you're, um, uh, let's put it this way, if you want to rationalize it, think of it like not giving up, but getting something greater. Others say it's a form of compromise. I give up this because I get something in return. But on a deeper level, what is really the approach to love and relationships, marriage and so on? The same question, as I said globally, the issue of individuality and community. The individual, the individuals and how they come together. So this question is a big question across the board, as I mentioned, from the global, from the political, the historical, and all the way to the personal and even within ourselves, our own inner conflicts. So we have ourselves a big question. And after bringing the big question, I want to bring it back to this week's Torah chapter. This week's Torah chapter answers this question in the most brilliant way, and it goes back thousands of years. The chapter is called Vayakel. It's the next to last chapter in the book of Exodus, the second book of the Torah. And this year, because of the Hebrew leap year, well, the Hebrew leap year in order to reconcile between the solar and lunar um, calendars. So the Hebrew leap year has an extra month, and thus, in months like this, there's 13 months of the lunar year, we have, we break apart certain chapters, where usually this chapter would be read to the next Pekude, you have Vayakel and Pekude separate. What does the word Vayakel mean? Vayakel, Moshe, Moshe gathered together. 
is the root of the word is kahal. Kahal. You hear kahal, kihila. A Hebrew word for community, for group, for a gathering of many. And it's rooted here, maybe the first documentation in the Bible, first documentation in history of the of the idea of a group. So what does it say? The Medrash says on Vayak HaMesha, it's also cited in the Code of Jewish Law, that Moses, one of the things that he, that he uh, one of the edicts that he decreed, that he established before he passed on, was that the Jews should be lahakil kihilas, based on this verse. Vayak HaMesha, Moses gathered, it's not the only time in the Torah it says so, but here it's the, the beginning of the chapter, that every Shabbos and holidays, the Jews should gather together, lahakil kihilas, they should gather communities and study and to and to and to dialogue and to pray. So the concept of Kehila was created. Which you know when you want to get beyond all the corruption and the contamination of any given issue, you always have to go to its root. Like it is with medicine. There's remedial medicine and there is preventive medicine. You know, you could solve problems with band aids or painkillers. That solves a short term issue. Or you can get to the root of an issue. And this is a very quintessential and uh, inimitable approach of Torah when it looks at an issue. You know, we all have our issues, right? So you can look at an issue and you describe its symptoms. This is how I'm reacting to it. This is what impact it has on me. This is uh, you know, all the behavioral symptoms that any particular issue causes us. But then there's the root of it. What's causing it? Why are we experiencing fear or anxiety? Why are we being tentative? Why are we um, depressed? Why anything that's happening to us, what is the root of it? Now sometimes the root can be a superficial one and you can easily identify it. But very often, especially more serious issues, the root is far deeper than that. So all that I spoke about earlier, about group and herd mentality, conformity, and all the destruction caused over the years due to brainless and blind obedience without challenging or questioning. You have to go back to the root. To say, for example, let's throw out the baby in the bathroom, let's get rid of all communities and all groups and all type of leaders because it could become corrupt, is not necessarily the solution. Because if you had no community, no group, we'd still have anarchy. Then everyone would be doing what they want. There'd never be any coexistence. It's pretty obvious that for any coexistence, there has to be, for any cooperation, there has to be some type of interaction. So we cannot just go back to dog eats dog and every, the survival of the fittest. But to understand that really the power of what a group is about and eliminating the negative parts of it and just embracing the positive, we go back to the root. Why did Moses designate this kehillah thing? The idea of a group. And I'll, I'll, make the, I'll, I'll amplify this question. I remember in this class, I had this question a number of times. People who begin to be introduced to Jewish concepts they go to synagogue, and they pray, they open up a, a prayer book, start reading, everybody, the whole group, the whole, the whole minion, the whole uh, congregation is reading the same prayers. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Shabbos, other holidays. So the first question that many people ask, very what's called a klotz kasha, an obvious question, so obvious nobody, people don't always spell it out. And that is, if prayer is service of the heart, I'm speaking from my heart to God, why the need to all of us say the same words? You know, everybody can come into the synagogue and pour your heart out to God, whatever it is that you need: health, clarity, uh, shidduch, soulmate, whatever it may be. Why are we forcing ourselves to read words, even if you know Hebrew? Especially if you don't know Hebrew, why are we forcing ourselves to? Conform to particular words, and all of us say it together. Shema Yisrael, Hashem. Okay, Hashem. Even if one could argue that there are certain benefits of a group type of prayer, but where, where's the individuality? And then when you start looking around and looking through other parts of Judaism, I mean, this really can apply to any system, but I'm speaking about Judaism. Same thing. You come to a Seder table, everybody's doing the same thing. So it's true, different communities have different customs, which we'll talk about. But generally speaking, it's like some type of, it's conformist. And you ask anybody that has some type of a little independent spirit, that's one of the biggest issues they have with religion. It's dogmatic and conform, conformist driven. 
imposing its dogma, its rules, rules and rituals and so on. Which doesn't surprise us why there's a statistic in the United States today, maybe in other countries as well, that 90% of Americans will say that they are somewhat spiritual and have some relationship with God. It's a big number. And 40% will affiliate with some religion. Now 40 to 90% is not a small uh, discrepancy. Basically, simply stating one thing. Religion has nothing to do with spirituality, and spirituality has nothing to do with religion. Most people define spirituality as free-spirited, non-conformist, non-guided and regulated by rules and rituals. And religion is associated with ritual and laws and a certain denomination, a certain religion, a certain set of services, a certain synagogue or church or temple. That's how it's seen. Most will not say that religion and, and spirituality go together. Very two different worlds. When I first recognized that years ago, it, made, it was to me so ironic, because to me, Judaism was always about soul and body, and they went hand in hand. There was no such thing as a ritual without a spiritual, and vice versa. We'll soon discuss that. But that's not the perception most people have. And the reason is obvious, because you speak to most people who are so-called religious, they're very ritualistic, very rigid, I would even go further, mechanical, robotic. How many other synonyms can I give? I think you get the idea. So that gives the impression that it's not, it's not about some type of thought-through personal experience. It's about doing the rules. Now some will justify it with saying, hey, at least it keeps a social order. You know, it's true, it may... Uh, what, what, what do I want to use? Crush or um, quell individuality to some extent, but it keeps a social order. People know this is the rules. This is what you do. This is what you don't do. Children need such discipline. That's the justification. So at best, yes, we're giving up certain individual freedoms for the greater good. Is that true? Because then the big philosophical question is. Why then did God create individuality in the first place? Why do we have 7 billion people on this planet and each one, like the Talmud says, ain't they a saying Shavas? They don't think alike. They don't look alike. They're no two exact alike clones. There's no such thing. Even in the same family. Even identical twins are not exact. And the, and the Mishnah says in, the, in Sanhedrin very clearly, why did God create the human being as an individual as opposed to all animals which were created in herds? That word herds, it wasn't one cow was created, the whole species of cows were created. Why were a human being, Adam and Eve, created as one individual? So the Mishnah said, the answer is because to teach us that every person must, must is obligated to say that the world was created for me, just for me. Not in a selfish and narcissistic way, but in a responsible way. That you have the ability to either build the world or destroy it. And when you save a life, you save a universe. And when you, God forbid, destroy a life, you destroy a universe. So individuality is not some aside. It's not some accident. It's part and parcel and inherent to existence. So if God wanted us to give up this individuality for the greater good, why create it in the first place? So one cynical, very religious guy once told me, he created individuality in order for us to destroy it. In other words, it's like an assign. It's a test. Like there are a lot of tests. Individuality itself is the test. You create your individual spirit in order for you to eliminate it and conform to a greater good. You know, I didn't even go into debate with this question because that sounds a little ridiculous. Uh, I understand that we are, there are many tests that are provided to us. But this, the Mishnah says clearly, that's not the answer it gives. It doesn't say it create individuality for us to overcome it. Create individuality for us to feel a sense of obligation, a sense of importance and significance, that you matter, that your actions matter, that you're responsible for your life, and that you're not just part of one big group. You are, the whole world rests on your shoulders in some ways. It's a very different answer than saying individuality is, is a problem. So how do we deal with all of this? Going back to the question of prayer, as I said, and I've, I've dealt with this in real time, with real challenging questions, that seemingly it's so conformist-driven. So the best place to look, as I said, is that the root, the first place, by Yakel. Why did Moses create this group mentality? Another interesting footnote 
not footnote, I think it's also more than a footnote, it's important. If the Bible and Torah and Judaism religion is so associated with conformity, why are Jews always disagreeing with each other? How come they say three Jews, five opinions, if not more? One Jew, you have five opinions, actually. You know, you ask a Jew. Well, it depends what you're talking about. If it's today, it's this way. If it's that way, you know. This fierce individuality that is such a, a staple of, Jew, of the Jewish people, where did that come from if it's all driven by conformity for thousands of years that we've been conforming to rituals? So you don't have to look far. Go back to our roots. The first Jew of all, Abraham. What was Abraham? Abraham was the ultimate nonconformist. First of all, there were no synagogues or yeshivas and establishment. So he had to, he, everything he did, he built on his own. He actually grew up in an environment that was a pagan, idol-worshipping environment, and he defied them all. He actually had to be a biggest pioneer. And if you look in the history, after Abraham, his children, grandchildren, all the, Moses, Mordechai, coming up, Purim soon. These are people that defied the, and were nonconformists. Everyone bowed to Haman. Mordechai refused. So imagine today you're in an office, and there are thousands of employees, and the boss comes in, and the boss likes when everybody just gives a little bow to him. Okay? So you do a big thing. That's what you have to incite him. One obstinate Jew says, nope, I'm not bowing to this guy. And the other Jews or the other people say, big thing, don't, let's not get him angry. You know, he has a control over our lives. What's the big thing? You show him a little bow. Nope. I don't want to give in, one inch. I won't not show any respect. What kind of um, abstinence is that? That's what Mordechai did. La Yichre will not bow with the statement that we Jews don't bow to anything that is man, no man and to no man-made create, creations. We bow only to God, period. You think, why? This is the ultimate nonconformity. This actually, some people explain, is the root of a lot of anti-Semitism. The Jews refused to yield. They refused to conform. They refused to be like us. They insist on dressing their own way, speaking their own way, doing their own thing. <clears throat> so it's hardly natural to a Jew to be a conformist. So of course, the question then begs, so why is so much religion associated with conformity today? So I've discussed this a number of times, because anything, once it becomes mechanical and institutionalized, risks runs the risk of becoming robotic. But it's not at the core what Judaism is about. Judaism is about creating revolution, defying the materialistic perspective and attitude to life, and introducing a higher purpose. You want to read an interesting book, it's called On Two Wings, by Michael Novak. He's a scholar, not Jewish. It's a it's an it's a somewhat of an academic not really an academic book, it has a lot of correspondence and writings of the founding fathers. His premise is that the United States and its constitution and the Declaration of Independence and the basis, the foundations of this country, are built on his words, on Jewish metaphysics. Even though they were deists, Christians, Protestants, yet it's built not on Christian ideas, but on Jewish ideas, Torah ideas. Which is interesting. None of the founding fathers were Jewish. As a matter of fact, it would be hard for you to feel hard-pressed to find any Jews they knew. So where did they get these ideas? So some people say uh, sarcastically, well, that's exactly why they got it right, because they didn't meet Jews, they just took it from the books. <coughs> And fascinatingly, they were able to build a structure of a country built on these type of Jewish themes. Read the book. It's a very interesting book. And he, he doesn't, it's not a theory. He's built on correspondence and communications of John Adams and Madison and, uh, and Jefferson and uh, Thomas Paine and, and, the, and the, the, the whole gang that lived then. All those uh, founding fathers, all, each in their own way. One of the things that he makes a point there that, that I'm addressing right now is the ability to e pluribus unum in every dollar bill and every uh, currency? What does it mean? E pluribus unum is Latin for from the many one. Pluribus is plural. Unum is one. From the many one. Fundamental principle of the United States: many individuals. But how do we create one without compromising the oneness? Which is why it's so vital the whole Bill of Rights and how that fits into the whole structure. And yet a union. It's a union. A union of states, a union of cities, a union of municipalities, a union of individuals. The challenge I mentioned earlier, how do you balance individual rights 
with the greater common good. We also know on the currency it says, in God we trust, which was a fundamental principle, even though they were deists, but they placed in the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal, <clears throat> and have thus inalienable rights. They understood that the foundation for individual rights comes to come from some divine place. Because if it comes from men, men can choose to deprive and say some more equal than others. If it's God-given, that's a God-given right, then every individual, no matter what color skin, no matter what denomination, no matter what faith or no faith, has absolute divine rights, which is the foundation of this country. At the same time, we have the conflicts. Okay, what happens if your freedom of speech and my freedom of speech conflict? You're offending me. So we know the battles that go on in courts and so on about these issues. So I'm submitting here that all this is rooted, as the Founding Fathers knew, in the Vayakel of Moshe, in this gathering together and, and this type of balance. <clears throat> so the key, the key point is as follows. Before Moses gathered the people together, remember they were, they were a bunch of individuals, all children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, fierce individuals, who, whose life was all about nonconformity and building a whole new way of looking at the world. In one sentence you can say, materialism dictates conformity, and spirituality dictates freedom, and nonconformity. Because materialism by definition is run by rules. You eat, I eat. Survival makes something very in common among all of us. We all need to survive. And that survival creates also a competition, and also the need for us to work together. Spirit, on the other hand, is not defined by material needs. So spirit allows itself to soar, called transcendence. And transcendence is very individualistic. The way you transcend, the way I transcend is very different. The food you eat and the food I eat is very similar. So anything that's material in the material world is commonality, is commonality and therefore conformity. You can build a business around it. When it comes to transcendence and personal life, love, relationships, it's very, very customized and very unique to each of us. So long before there was a Vayakel Moshe, before a gathering, there was a bunch of individuals. And when they stood at Mount Sinai, there's an interesting measure that says there were a few million people standing at Mount Sinai. We don't know the exact number, but it's a large number. The Ten Commandments were heard by all of them. And seemingly a very odd thing. When you read the Ten Commandments, Anoichi Hashem Alekecha, I am your God, Asher Yitzhichah that took you out of Egypt, and then continues on, it's all written in the singular. Let me explain. In Hebrew, as opposed to English, when you say you, in English, you can be, I can say to one individual you, I can say you to a group. In Hebrew, you say lecha to you, as a, or lach to a woman. You say lochem, shalom aleichem, to a group. The Ten Commandments being spoken to a group, you would think it should be spoken in the plural. Anoichi Hashem Alekechem, Asher Yitzisichem, Kabedas Avichem, everything in the plural. Loi Signavu, you shall not steal as a group. And yet it's all written in the, in the singular. So the Medrash says a fascinating thing because everyone standing there heard the message as if it was being spoken only to him or her alone and no one else is standing there. You know, the ultimate experience. You ever go to a concert and music touches you, it may be touching millions of other people or thousands of others, but what's touching you is you. And th that's all that matters. So that's what happened. It was a personal experience. It's like hearing words that resonate inside of you. So it makes no difference if there's other people there. That's why it was not spoken as a group language. It was not group um, think, thought, thought. As I said, herd mentality. It was individuals. Everyone heard what they needed to hear, the way they heard it. Then, once you have this type of individuality, everyone has their own individual relationship, then you bring them together, and what do you have? You have something more than the sum of the parts. If there was no individuality in the first place, bring, back, bring together a group, they'll become conformists. People will have to give up. But if there are a bunch of individuals, and now they say, you know what? I'm an individual. Now I come together with another... Now you have a synergy that's greater than the sum of the parts. 
So let me explain that with a, with a few examples. We see it in nature, we see it in our own human bodies, and we see it in things like music or other symmetrical and harmonious examples like art, like a book, and so on. So let me explain. Let's start with nature. So how many species are there on this earth? No one even knows. It's in the millions, if not billions, species, let alone individual creatures. When I say species of everything, species in the animal world, in the water world, amphibians, fish, in the vegetable world, the mineral, and there are species that haven't yet even been discovered. Okay. You add that all together, it's just a multitude impossible to even fathom. Trillions, trillions and trillions. Multiply that now by the molecule, the, the elements that they're all created, made of, the combination of different elements. The elements are in turn made up of more, even more molecules, which in turn are made up of even more atoms, subatomic particles. And you have numbers that are impossible to even utter. And yet, there's this unbelievable symmetry in nature. You don't have to look far. Look at any given group, uh, animal group, and you'll see. Even predator and prey, there's a balance. Predators don't kill all the all uh, all prey; they kill enough. As a matter of fact, science explains how they actually keep the population at bay. And if predators were killed, what happens? The prey end up consuming the earth, end up destroying. So there has to be a balance. You look at, for example far more vegetables and plants on this world than there are animals because they're consumed in larger number. So you see this unbelievable symmetry. I'm not even getting into the food chain of amazing food chain. The algae in one, in one area of the world gets deteriorated. 3,000 miles further, sea otters are starting to die. And you could trace it exactly what happens because one, one, one fish that migrates cannot, cannot feed itself so therefore it continue, dies. The predator that's supposed to eat it dies from its hunger and ends up affecting the whales or other species all across the world. This is just one of millions of examples. So tremendous symmetry and harmony, not only no conflict, harmony, despite the diversity. Take the human body. We have 75 trillions and million, trillion cells, trillion cells inside of us. You can start counting if you like. It's hard to count cells. Okay, we have thousands of systems at work. Just take take a piece of food, put it down your gullet. How many how many how, what kind of process begins to happen? You won't even imagine what happens. You know how your throat has to contract and then has to expand, and how it becomes it turns your teeth turn into mush and then it slowly goes down, and then the breakdown of enzymes till it becomes the blood, and then there's the waste being eliminated, the kidneys. Cleansing, the heart doing its thing. It's a whole, it's an unbelievable operation. And all in harmony. God forbid there's disease, of course, and illness, where the body does not function the way, but that's an anomaly. That's an aberration. So we have before our own eyes, Mipsari Echzalakam, my flesh shall behold God. From our flesh we can behold a harmony within a diversity. And no contradiction. You don't need the body to all become one organ for it to work together. As a matter of fact, if all the organs of the body said, let's have an organ convention, and we're all going to like experience each other, the heart, everything's, everyone's going to become the heart for one week. No brain, no liver, no kidneys, no nothing. No lungs. That would not exactly be a great idea. Do you agree? The key is to have distinction and diversity. At the same time, they all work together. Let's take music and art. Music is a great example as well. Musical notes, they're all precise, exactly in their own place, their own tempo, their own beat. And yet they come together and create this beautiful music. One does not have to be compromised to create the music. So this brings me back to what the Vayakil that Moses was intending to do. He was not looking to create a group that would annihilate individuality. He was looking to create a group that would create a synergy that cannot be the sum of the, that cannot be created by any individual part. As beautiful as musical note can be, you can't compare it to a composition, to a um, comprehensive composition of music where every note plays its thing and then complements every other note. Or like as it is in the human body, or as it is in nature. So going back to the question, is religion conformity? 
for those that are conformists. It may be, but it has nothing to do with Judaism. Judaism is music. Music. Prayer. Another name for prayer is shira, is song. Zimra. When you pray properly, yes, two people may say the same Shema, but it would be like two musicians playing the same song. And look at the difference. Everyone plays it with their own particular twist. You could hear one person play the song, it sounds horrible. Another person plays that same piece of music and it comes alive, magic. We're not supposed to ever pray the same way. Even Forget about two people. Even individually, when you say Shema each time, it should have completely different meaning. So it's not about fitting into words and all of us conforming to the same words. It's no different than using musical notes and using those notes to, to bring alive the soul of what the music is about. The notes are just a tool. They're just methods, a, 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 a methodology, a mechanism. However, due to laziness and ignorance and, and probably fear, many of our established systems and schools have turned become conformist machines. Because it's easy, it's just, to t- just what you do and that's it. To think, to customize, to personalize, takes work. You have a class of 20 students, it's far easier to just say everybody does the same thing. I, I remember I mean, even as a kid it bothered me, today much more, I understand it better, but you know, teacher, all 20 kids, everybody write the same thing. So I understand, of course, you don't, we don't have the resources to individual uh, attention for each student, but at the end of the day we are different. And there was never any emphasis on that difference. Now the an- simple answer is because one size fits all is much easier. If you can put them all into a herd, everybody's like, you know, r- running the same direction, you don't have less, less problems. But you don't cultivate the most important thing, what a child needs, is its spirit. You know, where do you see that spirit come out? When children play. No wonder that a classroom was a place where we always felt constricted, and when you went to play, you felt good. So everyone thinks, because play, you have no rules. Not necessarily, because you are maybe yourself more. If a classroom allowed you to be yourself in a healthy way, as like a musical note, at the same time learn to cooperate with other musical notes, I have no doubt you can make a classroom come very, be very exciting. <clears throat> it's too late for some of us, we're already out of school, but maybe the next generation will do something about it. You know? So, it all comes down to the appreciation, the sensitivity of understanding the individual in the context of the larger whole. When Moses gathered together the people and then said every Shabbos, every Yom to gather together, it was, a ma- it was a most magical, beautiful thing. He was teaching the power of synergy. So today it's a popular word, synergy. What's synergy? It's not quite energy, it's synergy. It's the energy of many. E pluribus unum. What is it? So the Talmud puts it this way. Two people, uh, each of them can, can lift 100 pounds. How much can they both lift together? Lift together. Most people will say 200 pounds. If I can lift 100, you can lift 100, Barry, right? So together, 200. It's not correct. Something happens when two people come together, and together we can lift approximately 220 maybe. And if you put three people, it's more than three times, and it starts to exponentially grow as the group grows. So everyone wonders, one second, where's that invisible extra, who gave, who gave us 20 power to give 20 more pounds? I can only lift 100, you can only lift 100. How, where, who has the, where did the 20 come from? The answer is something happens when two people come together that's more than the sum of the parts. And just to give a very simple example, example of a word. Take a word. Let's take a name. What's, uh, what's your name? Yeah. Yeah. I knew that, but I wanted to say it. So Miriam. This was not pre-planned. I didn't even know you'd be here. So Miriam is, is, is a name, a Hebrew name made up of four Hebrew letters. Mem, Reish, Yud, Mem. Is my spelling right? Okay. Or in English it would be M-I-R-I-A-M. They're different spellings. But so when you say the Miriam, Mem, Reish, Yud, Mem, so if you have a Mem, a Reish, a Yud, and a Mem, it's four independent letters. You put them together, you have more than just four letters come together. You have an, a name. A name that has a meaning. A name that's an individual with a personality, and someone calls you Miriam, they don't just mean four letters, they mean the whole you. The name Baruch, blessing, is more than just the sum of the parts. So it's more than just the base rate, just like with the weight. It's not just 100 and 100 coming together. Something happens when a group 
comes together. However, with a big however, it's critical that the group understand that they're, that they're individuals that are coming together. It's not some group mentality. It's not like we're giving up everything and we're just now following the herd, following the, the uh, blindly following whatever the leader is saying. It's individuals who've chosen to come together like musical notes to create a greater music. That was what Moses was saying. He says, you're going to be traveling through your lives, through history. There's going to be difficult times. Be yourselves, but from time to time come together and you'll become a power that will be impossible to beat. Like the Medrash gives another exa- an analogy in a different verse. It says, Atem mitzvah yem kochem. You stand all together. So the Medrash compares it to a bushel of uh, twigs. Each twig is e- fragile, can be cracked easily, can be broken. Put together, thousands of twigs together, and time together in a bushel. Try to break that. Same twigs. Why, you say, why can't I just break them one at a time? Because now when they come together, you see this also in military strategy, and many, many ways where you see a group suddenly has a power that's more than just individual. Of course, you have to also mention psychological power. You know, one individual, no matter how great a warrior you are, or great, how strong you are, when you're with a team, that is equally, each have their own strengths, it gives you more confidence. And you can't quantify it. It's not like saying, oh, bring me a partner, or bring me three other people on my team, and I'll be three times more confident. No, it's far more than three times. It adds a whole different quality. And this is true when you think about kindred spirits. What's a kindred spirit, you know? Friends, real friends. And I bless everybody to have a real friend. A real friend is a very powerful thing. And I mean a friend, I'm not even talking now on a romantic level, on a deeply on an intimate level. I'm talking about a friend. The power of friends is the power of two individuals who can respect and trust each other and at the same time have a synergy while their individuality is still there. So there's the joke about the kindred spirit that I should mention. I usually use it when I speak and sometimes go over time and speak a little too long. So you know, you got to re- re- calm down the audience that may feel restless. So I use this joke. I always buy another five minutes with it. Ten minutes maybe. And that is that there was this guy who got up to speak. He's so enamored with himself, he just doesn't even recognize what time it is. He talks and talks and talks and talks. And the clock is ticking an hour, two hours, three hours. You know, some people just can't sit any longer. And they just, till that they were being respectful. So by three hours already, like half the crowd starts shuffling out. So you'd think most people would take get the message. Time to stop, right? No, but this guy is so in his own self-delusional uh, um, narcissism comes to the opposite conclusion. That the people that left, okay, they appreciated it till now, but now those that remain, they really appreciated me, so they really want to hear the best I have. So he just starts adding more, he starts going deeper into it. It's another hour. Another half of the crowd leaves. And the more they leave, the more that remain, he thinks these are the people that connect to him. Little does he realize that either they're too respectful or they're asleep or they don't even know he's going, whatever the reason. Finally, it's 2 o'clock in the morning, he's been speaking for 5 hours, and there's one guy left in the audience. And he feels, now he's found this kindred spirit. Here's the guy I've been looking for my whole life, this lonely soul. Finally found someone that's willing to sit here five hours to hear me. So he begins to pour out his whole heart and soul, his whole personal life, his confessions, everything. Finally he finishes. He goes over to the guy. He says to him, so what would you think? You know, he thought he found his soulmate here or whatever. So the guy says, I don't know, I didn't hear anything you said. So he said, what are you sitting here for? He said, I'm the next speaker. You know? So this is what I always use when you have the, the talk. So some people, sadly, don't have a kindred spirit, so they see it everywhere, and they're misreading, and they realize it's not, not that the guy is not interested in what you have to say. But on a positive note, a kindred spirit is a beautiful thing to have. I say l'charav, the Mishnah says, appoint for yourself a mentor. Or and acquire a friend. Acquire. It's different than appointing. It's acquiring. People have real friends, especially friends that go back a long time. There's a deep loyalty and power to a friend that's hard to really uh, replicate. So kindred spirit, it could also include, obviously, a soulmate. It could include a spouse. But a kindred spirit is a very powerful force because it means that you're not alone in this world. In the words of Hillel, im eina nili mili. If I'm only for myself, if I may not leave me, rather, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? 
First starts the individual, but then comes the second half. Imanila atzmi, if I am for myself, what am I? So it's seemingly a contradiction here, right? It's not. Same statement, the same teacher says both. If I'm not for myself, who will be for me? And if I'm only for myself, what am I? You need both. It's not a contradiction as we see in nature, as we see in the human body, as we see in music, as we see in any act, art and any work of beauty. You'll see beauty is a, is, a, is a harmony within diversity. There are studies made, what makes a beautiful face? What's a beautiful face? I know it sounds odd, people, but some people want to understand the science of a beautiful face. Why do some people, some faces just, we say it's a beautiful face? And it's hard to quantify. Is it the eyes, the nose, the ears, the complexion? The answer is, it's not, not, it's not one thing. There's some symmetry to what's considered to be a beauty that, that, that attracts us. A certain harmony. Obviously, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. But there are things that are objectively beautiful. Its beauty is always connected to symmetry. It's not connected to one feature. Yeah, a person, of course, can have beautiful eyes. But, for, but firstly, even eyes is also made up of many parts. A person can have a beautiful nose. But real beauty, you see, a beautiful face, a beautiful personality, is always harmony within diversity. So one color may be beautiful, one musical note may be beautiful, may sound beautiful, but its real beauty happens when there's many notes, many colors, combined in the right order, and suddenly you have what we call a work of art, a work of beauty, type of symmetrical harmony that, that emerges. It is more than the sum of the parts. That's the definition of synergy. So Vayakam Moshe, what Moses was saying was, was instituting a new concept. Not of the group as opposed to the individual, the group as an enhancer of the individual. We pray in synagogue as a group, not because the group replaces, but it enhances. That when a few people who are calling out to God from their hearts, and each one in their own individual way, and they do it together, you get a synergy, you get a power that helps each of them. Like it is with any type of team effort. Unfortunately, through history, the group began to be corrupted and abused by people who were selfish and insecure, and they began using group mentality and herd mentality and other such names to control people, feeding on people's fears of non-acceptance, feeding on people's fears of not wanting to stand out, and other fears of wanting to be part of the whole picture, created mind control, created other types of control to force people into an unnatural space. Look at children, young children, as I always mention. They're, all, they're, bounding, they're bound, bouncing around bound, with boundless energy without any limits. They don't conform to anything. Now, obviously, as we grow older, we need to be seasoned and we need discipline and so on. But discipline is never an end in itself. Discipline, look at even someone sitting at a piano and creating the magic of music. Discipline is a part of letting, releasing and harnessing that power. Not meant to be an end in itself. Kvura is meant to be a way to get the chesed channeled properly. So the rules are not ends in themselves. The rules are ways of harnessing, of channeling, of directing, of, of cultivating, and so on. But as I said, in a lazy society, an unhealthy society, one that is also driven by fear, we begin to use the discipline as an end in itself just to keep people at bay, to control them. And people project. When I'm afraid of who I am, my own voice, I'm afraid of your voice too. So we begin to be afraid of individual voices. Judaism was never meant to be that way. We're coming in a few months from now, Passover. Passover stands out above all the four questions. Children asking questions. Encouraged to ask from the youngest of age. Some would say, wow, that's like, why, why are you, they're going to they're gonna be skeptical as they grow older. Why do you have to uh, rush the process and incite them and get them to ask questions to, at a younger age? Because asking questions in a healthy way is what makes us human. It means I have an opinion, I have a feeling, I have a question, I'm, I'm, I'm challenging. Yes, there's unhealthy questions. There are people who ask unhealthy, what's that? an unhealthy question? I, w- I should rephrase it. Not a question is unhealthy. The attitude is unhealthy. Like, call it, 
you know, <coughs> unhealthy skepticism. That's someone who's locked in their position for whatever immature reason and just looks for excuses to defend it. So they're skeptical about everything. Anything you tell them, they, they have an argument against it. They're not looking for the truth. They're looking to, just, uh, to justify their own position. Healthy skepticism is someone who explores, who challenges you. Tell me an idea, I listen, and then I ask you a few questions. Not to just challenge the challenge for its own sake, but to achieve clarity. And if you can make a good case, I'll be persuaded. And if you can't, I'll challenge you further. Not allowing our personal, parochial, and partisan and emotional interests to get in the way of the discussion. That is harmony within diversity. So the Seder, we have all the four different types of children. We have the wise one, we have the wicked one, we have the one that, the simple one, the one that doesn't know how to ask a question. And you say, encourage him to ask. Apsachle, you open his mouth, help him ask. Encouraging questions and challenges. You open up a Talmud and you see fierce individuality. Look at how they argue. Everything. This one reads, quotes a verse in one way, interprets it one way, the next one comes and, and says, no, it means something else. And brings a contradiction, a counter-argument, another counter-counter-argument. And all in the name of love. Because they were arguing for the idea. They weren't arguing who's going to be, who's going to win. They were looking for clarity. Honest. Integrity. Secure people have no problem arguing. But the argument doesn't have any personal side. There's no bitterness to it. There's no bite. It's about clarity. So Vayakal Moshek, Moses was saying, come together, argue, debate, but you're all brothers and sisters, and fight it out in a loving way, and achieve the deepest clarity. The deepest clarity is achieved when there's a counter-argument. One of the great methods of, of getting clarity is, what's the clarity? Let's say you come up with a business idea. You come up with any other concept. And what do you do? You are very convinced of it. The healthiest thing to do is challenge your own conviction and your own uh, premises. And if you can't do it, bring someone else in that challenges it. Because that's how you stretch the idea. That's how you come back to it. And then you say, you know what, I challenged it, but I still like the first approach. Don't have any preconceived notions. Don't be afraid to challenge your most precious and cherished ideas. Because then you can come back and say, I challenged it, and I still feel strong about it a certain way. Or you come to modify it. This is the process of real knowledge, gaining knowledge, clarity, objectivity. If you could do it yourself, that's great. Some people are very good at doing that. But often you need someone else. That's why you have in companies and certain businesses, you'll have different type-minded people. You'll have the pragmatic one, you'll have the idealistic one. You'll have the vision guy, 30,000 foot level, you have the practical, the operations person. And often they conflict because operations sees things on the ground level, the vision sees it from the top. And you argue about it till you get to a real clarity that works on both levels. That's the way it should work. Because that's how you get real, you stretch an idea in every direction. I often do it in my office team, and sometimes we have to, we have to in, in, uh, in uh, what's the word, uh, um, not in doctrine, it, in train people into this method of thinking. Because you come up with an idea, and everybody's working on the idea, and then suddenly someone will say, one second, Let's challenge this whole idea. Let's say we didn't do it. Let's say we did the exact opposite. So remember, newcomers will say, what's that? What you, oh, we just said we're going this direction. Why are you going that direction? But that's how you stretch an idea. You look at it and say, okay, so good, such a good idea. Let's do the exact opposite. What would happen? Or let's not do it. What would happen? That forces you to look at it from every possible angle. So, the, so basically, another example of Vayakel, how the group enhances the individual. But this requires an understanding that you could bring the two together. And philosophically speaking, the way Hasidic thought puts it, is because God is neither one nor pluralistic. So when there's a dimension that transcends the individual and transcends the group, that can truly bring them together. As I said, that invisible synergy. You can't quite put your finger on it. You, know, you, can, you can experience, you can love yourself, you can... It have many qualities, but then when you find love in another person, and two people marry in a sacred union, there's something you can't put your finger on it. What, what is this? More than the sum of the parts, not just more than the sum of the parts, it's a whole different dimension. Because there are areas that are beyond what we would call the unit and the group. There are areas, as I said, that they come together and they melt together. When you're reading a book and you see all these words, you're looking at a piece of art, you're listening to music, you're not hearing thousands of different notes, you're hearing one harmony. 
you're hearing one beautiful flow. You break it down, you say, hey, second, this flow is made up of part, part. Why? Because something is happening here that is transcending both the individual and the group to the point where it becomes one flow, but that flow is only possible through the individual elements. That's the beauty of a real relationship. Where you could have the individual without any compromise and discover something greater than the sum of the parts. It's hard to imagine when you are living your own life and based on your own rules, and you say, hey, what do I need another person in my bedroom? What do I need another person in my bathroom? What do I need another person in my medicine cabinet? I have it all worked out. So you see the other as an intrusion because you're not thinking into you're thinking you're thinking in terms of me, 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 and your turf. But when you introduce the spiritual dimension and you introduce the godly dimension, you come to realize there are experiences that are greater than you. And not compromising you. Not like you have to give everything up. But that requires a different type of mindset. Because most of us think, hey, this is my rules. This is what I do from 9 to 5 or from morning to night. And now someone else enters my life. I have to suddenly change my schedule. Or I have to change my, my activities. That's the thinking of a person who's in a limited box and only sees things from their box. But if you step back and say, one second, all beauty and art is created by diversity and all of it is created by transcendence, why is it not the case in relationships? But it's hard to do when you feel insecure or fearful or anxious because you don't want to give up your turf. You're very protective. So a healthy part of a human being is to come to realize that you are the greatest when you are able to interact with others. That doesn't compromise the individuality. The most secure people on earth are the ones that will be coexisting with everybody else. The most secure people are the ones that can sit with someone that they completely disagree with and not be flustered. Because they don't need, you don't need to be wrong for them to be right. They're, they're not defined by others, they're defined by, from within. Teaching now, as I teach every morning, and you can check it out on YouTube, a uh, very dense, maybe the most, the most complicated mystical discourse ever delivered, called Ayin Beis, on the name of the year, the Hebrew year of 5, 6, um, 14. I'm sorry, 5, no, no, 5, 6, 7, 4, 19, 14. So, so the discussion there, Ayin Beis actually is the 1912, 5, 6, 7, 2, but but, when, but it goes over, it continues for a few years. And there's a long discussion there about these two types of, we'll call it esteem or eminence. An eminence that just radiates from within, that you just feel a certain inner self-esteem, and you don't need to diminish someone else for you to be. And then there's an eminence and an esteem that only exists if everyone else is diminished. Because it's not really inherent. So if you, for example, let's say you grabbed um, inappropriately some piece of property, or something that doesn't belong to you, you're going to be very defensive and very, very insecure with it. So you're going to fight for your turf, and anyone comes close to it, you're going to not let them. You're going to see them as a threat to you. Whereas someone who's very secure with themselves and it comes from within, nothing can threaten that because it's their own. They really own it. They didn't grab it. It's not superimposed. It's not. It's not. It's not um, acquired. It's inherent. It's natural. He discusses at length these two types of psych- psyches of a person who is, we'll call it, imposed and acquired eminence and respect, majesty, and someone who has inherent majesty. You'll see people, you meet people, they don't need to show off, they don't need anybody to know, they just are. Like if someone will say to you an insult, you know, you're not so smart, you're not so wealthy, you're not so beautiful. You know, many of us will fight for that. But let's say someone says to you, you're not alive, you're not so alive. You laugh at them, because you know you're alive. Your, your, your heart is beating, you're walking around. What do you mean? I, I'm not talking about not so alive, meaning that you're um, a deadened person. I mean to say physically. Because you know you're alive. You're, you're completely secure. No, nothing, no one can shake that. But when it comes to other things, smart and so on, you say, well, second, maybe, maybe I'm not that smart. You don't feel it necessarily from within, so another person can challenge it. People who are extremely secure are secure because that's who they are. And that's it. It's not secure because they went to some security school that taught them how to become secure. They're secure with them, with their own self. It's often a result of growing up in a nurturing home that reinforced a sense of self and reinforced your own confidence within yourself. But it doesn't come from someone. No one gave you confidence. Confidence comes from within, real confidence. Someone that was uh, taught to be confident or forced to be confident, then their confidence is very um, fragile, very shaky. 
because they're only confident when it's certain terms and so on. Their value, in other words, is based on other people's opinion, not on their own self, self-self. And there's a very different approach to life when your value is dependent on what others think, whether it's parents, whether it's bosses, whether it's friends, and so on. The truly self-esteem people are the people who don't, doesn't matter what others think, because the value comes from within. So, to sum up, Vayakel, the chapter of Vayakel is a tremendous insight into the power of harmony, the power of synergy, and it comes after there's an individuality. We will talk about individuality more at length next week because the Pekude, interestingly, the next chapter, the Pekude means to count. And counting, you can only count individual. You can't count a group. So in contra- so this week, the discussion is on the harmony within diversity, the group, power of group in the healthy way, the healthy synergy, as opposed to unhealthy grouping and herd mentality. And then the, next week we'll talk more about the power of individuality and how to access that voice. So, I, as a final uh, statement, I would say, find your kindred spirit if you can. Look around and see if you can find people who don't compromise who you are, but enhance it. And enhancing means that you see they're secure, they celebrate your celebrations. They don't have to make you less for them to become more. And they don't feed off you like a parasite. Some people, the only reason they have you as a friend is because they need, they feed off of you. It's not like they respect for you who for you are, for who you, you they don't respect you for who you are. They respect what you do for them. You know? So it's a, a good time to review some of our real friends and see, do you have friends that just recognize and respect you for who you are without any agenda? And vice versa, do you respect others in that way? That's where Vayakal comes into play. It's a critical component because we live in a world where everything is almost a negotiation. I I give you this, you give me that. That type of pure, um, unconditional acceptance, not so common. So I was blessed upon all of you that everybody should find that type of kindred spirit. We at The Meaningful Life try to um, celebrate kindred spiritism with everybody we meet. For me, it's always an honor and uh, to um, participate in the journey of every majestic soul on this earth, and hopefully together we can play some real unique music in a real vayakel, in a real synergetic form. So until next week, everybody should have a very good week. Um, next week we continue the journey. Philip will be giving his class tomorrow night. And if you have not, uh, if you don't, we don't have your email address, please let us know. Anyone, whether in cyberspace or here, feel free to be in touch if any way that we can help you in your journey. That's our honor and our pleasure. Everyone have a very good week. Thank you so much.